Okay. Well, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm Elaine Orbein, the President and CEO of PAFC, and I'm I'm sure that uh, I'm talking to many, many colleagues from across the country this morning, and a very warm welcome to everyone. Our co-chairs uh, of our CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative um, are not able to be on the call with us this morning, and of course, as everyone knows, that's Darlene Bolivar from the IWK in Halifax and Tracy Wrong from the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa. Um, I'm going to step in on their behalf this morning uh, very happily and, uh, and extend a very warm welcome to everyone. Happy spring as well. Um, we're going to continue this morning um, as, uh, as per the invitations to this webinar that everyone has received in our dialogue and series of, of webinars with our colleagues from Accreditation Canada. And um, I believe um, that Leslie Galloway is, uh, from Winnipeg uh, is still trying to um, uh, dial in to the um, presenters uh, component of the webinar. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that that happens in the next couple of minutes. But in just a few minutes, it's going to be my pleasure to welcome um, both uh, Greg Kennedy from Accreditation Canada. Uh, Greg is from the Program Development uh, Division of, of Accreditation Canada, and, uh, and we'll be welcoming, as I say, Leslie Galloway from Winnipeg Children's as well. Just before we get started to sort of help everybody uh, enjoy today's webinar and really gain as much from it as possible, and also to encourage an interaction and dialogue, um, I did want to mention that the that everyone, all of our participants' lines um, have been muted, and Lisa Stromquist, our patient safety coordinator, is in fact at the controls there. Questions may be asked by typing in your question into the control panel. Um, and you should be able to see that that is part of your screen in front of you. Um, Lisa is going to monitor the questions and, um, and will be, uh, we'll be able to, um, to facilitate that interaction. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone that our next patient safety collaborative call is on April the 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern uh, Daylight Time now. And again, uh, we will be sending out lots more information on that event. Um, and that today's presentation um, presentations will be posted on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network and that all of our past presentations are posted there as well. And, uh, and you can um, access the Knowledge Exchange Network directly from uh, the CAFC website. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, many of you have contributed to and participated in CAFC and ISMP Canada's Opioid Safety High Alert Medication Project. And as always, it's so important for me on behalf of CAFC to take to say thank you to those who have participated and who continue to provide leadership to this important work. Our phase three, which is the final phase of this work, and we're going to refer to that as our implementation and knowledge translation uh, component of, of the study, uh, is going to begin over the next, uh, within the next few weeks. Um, we have now confirmed our uh, partnerships with um, with uh, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and um, MedBuy, Baxter, and of course ISMP and CAFC are um, are co-facilitating this work. And um, what we're um, what we're going to be doing is um, bringing more information to the April 29th. Um, patient safety collaborative call um, to keep everybody informed and, uh, and engaged. Um, if you have any questions about that high alert uh, opioid safety program in the meantime, please don't hesitate to give me, um, uh, send me an email and or a phone call. And of course, I know that Lisa would be very happy to hear from you as well. I also wanted to mention that um, continuing under our patient safety programs, that the um, CAFC Pediatric Trigger Tool team 
um, is going to be sending out a very short survey. We're going to send this survey out to all of our um, CAFC liaisons uh, in April um, to really get your feedback on uh, your organization's knowledge and or use of the tool thus far. And again, for those of you who might not be familiar, um, you can view and download and um, uh, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to really spend uh, time with the uh, trigger tool, you can click um, and access it very simply from the CAFC website as well. Just uh, There's an icon that says CPTT right along the top line of our home page. Um, and again, as always, Lisa and or myself would be more than happy to provide any additional information or answer any questions. So um, at this point in time, um, it is truly my pleasure to turn the uh, microphone and, uh, and virtual stage over to our colleague, uh, Greg Kennedy, um, from Accreditation Canada. As I mentioned, Greg is with the Program Development um, uh, Division of, of Accred Canada, and in fact, um, I think it's very important, uh, Greg, for us to not only introduce you, but to say thank you to you and all of our Accreditation Canada partners for your continued collaboration with CAFC. And of course, that collaboration through CAFC extends to all of our member organizations and hospitals across the country. So Greg, a very, very warm welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. OK, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, in turn, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, the CAFC and the Patient Safety Collaborative for inviting me back after my first stint here in January. I, when I'm preparing for these sessions, I always find uh, researching into the pediatric health services to be very energizing. So it's nice for me to get out here and hear your stories and your ideas and your challenges and feed that back into our work at Accreditation Canada. Um, in my portfolio here, I oversee a lot of our patient safety initiatives, the performance measures, and the always fun and exciting required organizational practices. So two of those are what I'm going to talk to you about today, and those two ROPs are two client identifiers and verification processes for high-risk activities. I think I've got them. All right, here we go. So to give you a bit of an overview about what I'm going to talk about today, firstly, we're going to start with the two client identifiers ROP. I'll give you uh, a bit of an idea about the intent and the opera, operationalization of this ROP, and then some tips for application across the care continuum in some unique service environments. From there, I'm going to move on to the verification processes ROP. I'll talk to you a bit about the background and the impetus for that ROP and what Accreditation Canada's expectations are from organization. And then I'll try and give you some practical examples in uh, a pediatric setting. And I also want to pass along a few resources and key messages that I came across in digging up material for the session. So uh, this is the ROP chart. For any of you who are not familiar with the accreditation program, we define required organizational practices, or ROPs, as essential practices that an organization must have in place to enhance patient safety and to minimize risk. Uh, we have 36 ROPs right now across uh, applicable across various service areas. And the two that I mentioned that we're going to be focusing on today both fall under our patient safety goal area of communication. And one thing I really want to emphasize about the ROPs, uh, sometimes people view ROPs uh, as daunting as they can be sometimes as, as a, an element of their work that needs to be done for accreditation. And that's really not how the ROP should be viewed. Uh, these are really evidence-based best practices that uh, you should really strive to integrate into your everyday work to really improve the quality and the safety of the care that is being provided to patients in your organization. Before we get rolling further, I also want to take a second to uh, introduce you to a Pulitzer Prize candidate, and that's the ROP Handbook. In 
February of 2011, we released an updated version, which is available for download on our website. Uh, this version contains some updated versions of the MedRec ROPs and more specific to our purpose today. There's an updated guideline for the verification process with ROPs, which builds in some more examples of different processes that you can look at in your organization. So first up is the two client identifiers ROP. The single test for compliance in this ROP reads, the team uses at least two client identifiers prior to the provision of any service or procedure. And so this version is found uh, across our service excellence standards and uh, surgery, medicine services, ambulatory care, there's about 25 different ones where you'll see it. And there's also a slightly different version, our managing medication standard, which reads the team uses at least two client identifiers uh, before administering any medication. Taking a brief look at national compliance, this is a cutout from our 2010 report on ROPs. And what we see from 2008 to 2009 is really that the two client identifiers ROPs has been one of our shining stars. You'll notice it's shaded in blue and in the legend at the bottom that indicates it's one of our most notable improvements. So from 2008 to 2009, compliance rate across all sectors combined in Canada went from 67% up to 87%. And once we roll up our 2010 data, we'd expect that that probably has climbed even higher. So it really talks to organizations across Canada finding ways to integrate this into all steps of their workflow. So to give you an idea of what the intent behind this ROP is, it's really to, uh, it's a twofold intent. And it's firstly to reliably identify the individual as the person for whom a treatment is intended, and then the flip side of that to match a service or treatment to that individual. And this can include sort of a vast array of treatment procedures, specimen collection, test results, uh, delivery of medication, et cetera. So what type of identifiers are we looking for you to use as part of your two client identifiers? Uh, generally, in all hospital inpatients, uh, day procedure patients, and emergency departments, we would hope that patients should have a wristband. I'm going to speak to some uh, service areas where this may not apply in a minute. But in general, uh, we would hope that patients are wearing a wristband. And the identifiers we would look for on this wristband are the client's name, the date of birth, their address, uh, medical record number. Um, some of the more lucky organizations will be moving to barcodes in the future, which will really help with patient identification. And I just want to caution that uh, on the other side of the table, the things we definitely don't want you to use for patient identification are the room number due to multiple patients being included in a room and the physical location of the patients. Uh, I read a case yesterday where a patient in a room was moved next to the window to get some sun and ended up receiving their roommate's uh, medication. So those are, those are two to stay away from. Um, wherever possible, it's really best to encourage, uh, engage the patient and encourage their participation in patient identification. So if you can ask those patients open-ended questions to have them verify their identity, uh, you know, what is your name, what procedure are you here for, is much safer than you know, saying, are you John Smith, in which an agitated or a nervous patient may reply yes as sort of a reflex or inadvertently. Um, and really the thought behind the ROP is that before you provide any service or procedure, you verify, again, with the parent patient where possible, two of these identifiers. So part of what I was asked to talk about on the webinar today was some of the unique challenges that are faced in the pediatric environment and how the two client identifiers apply to those. So some of the challenges, the first one that really bubbled up in the literature was patient identification with neonates. And the challenges here uh, is that these patients are really, they're nonverbal, they're unable to actively participate in the patient identification process, and this really increases the likelihood of wrong patient errors. Um, 
Also, keeping these wristbands in place on a small patient can be a challenge because they have very small wrist and ankle size uh, and fragile skin, and there's often a need to remove these bands for placement of IV lines and other treatments. In reviewing the policies that I came across in my research, it was widely mandated that newborns have two identification bracelets attached immediately after birth. birth one of those were going on the wrist and one of those onto the ankle. And uh, a caution was that you should always be able to place one finger under the identification band just for safety to the child and comfort of fit. Uh, the label should include the name, if possible, of the child and the gender. Uh, if a name hasn't been given yet, as the, the notation you see on the screen, M infant or female infant can be used. The mother's information, her name, and possible her medical record number, and also the date and time of birth. And these should be checked against the mother's identification band before the baby is ever removed from the birthing room. And from there, it really comes down with these neonates to just checking, checking, and rechecking. Uh, the parents should be encouraged to participate in the process and to check their, uh, their infant's band each time they handle him or her or after a period of separation. And similarly, for the nursing staff, before the delivery of any treatment, um, any transfer between wards, and uh, on all of your daily checks, you should be looking to make sure those identifications match up. In some instances where problems arise, if, if there's a missing band that slipped off one of the children, the, either the ankle or the wrist, uh, the remaining band should be checked against the mother's identification wristband. Also following from that, if an infant is found with no identification labels at all, it's imperative that the nurses check the wristbands of all the other infants on the unit uh, to make sure that they're all accounted for. And once all those children are uh, confirmed with their identification bands, then with the mother, you can reapply identification bands to the, the neonate in question. <clears throat> in some instances in healthcare services where patients cannot wear a wristband, um, this could be because of a condition, uh, the treatment they're undergoing, if they have burns or, or major multiple trauma. A nurse can carry out a risk assessment based on the client's conditions and their service needs and takes the measures to reduce the risk of misidentification. Uh, these measures might include labeling of the patient's bed as opposed to a client wristband, displaying uh, their identification on a vital signs monitor that correlates with the patient's bed space. Or uh, in the context of the operating room, if a limb isn't accessible to attach the ID band to, it may be temporarily affixed to the patient's forehead, although this should be uh, removed and placed back on a limb prior to the patient's departure from the operating theater. <coughs> Uh, some additional exceptions are in the mental health setting where a patient may refuse to wear a wish, wristband um, or if the patient's condition or treatment makes this impractical. There uh, is an exception where a patient's photo can be used for identification purposes. Uh, I've also heard this question come in, and we've said that's okay in various home care settings with patients. In outpatient settings in various ambulatory care clinics, to the lack of uh, identification bands on the patients, there's really an increased importance that you engage the patient or family or guardian uh, to confirm the identity before any treatments occur. Um, some solutions I've seen in these outpatient settings were temporary name tags or ID cards that were passed out to patients uh, for the duration of their visit. And uh, I would actually really encourage during the discussion on this call, because I didn't find a lot of practical examples here, if there are people who could share their experiences with the group of how they approach patient identification in outpatient or ambulatory settings. A couple of resources regarding patient identification. Uh, the first is patient identification being one of the World Health Organization's top nine patient safety solutions that were identified. 
what the link to here is for sort of a two or three page fact sheet, which just gives a lot of practical tips that you could bring back to your organization, some quick wins that will improve your patient identification processes. And two policies that were very comprehensive that I came across in my searches uh, are included here. The first one, if you just Google what I've included, it had a great section for neonates and how to address pain, patient identification in that population. And another one from Western Australia, which just gave a really good PDF document of their policy. And that's, that's all stuff that you can pull back into your own organizational policies. I'm not going to go into the paper. I just wanted to bring it uh, for your interest, any of those who want to do a little further scientific reading. This paper talked about a study from a children's hospital where they actually surveyed their staff to identify a lot of risk areas and error traps related to patient identification. And from uh, those very rich results, they put some systems into place to improve their patient identification processes. And that's all outlined in this paper if you're interested to take a look. So now we move on to the verification processes for high-risk activities, ROP. Uh, this ROP reads, the team implements verification processes and other checking systems for high-risk activities. And the test for compliance outlines first that you take a look at your services and identify high-risk activities in your organization that you develop and implement verification processes, policies, uh, different checking system for these high-risk activities. And thirdly, that you evaluate these processes or systems you've put into place and use results from those evaluations to make improvements. Really, the, the thought behind this ROP is to permit organizations with the flexibility to take a look at their high-risk activities that are relevant to their service area in their care environment. Um, when searching, for example, uh, in the patient safety literature for this ROP, what you'll often find is most of these high-risk activities, or at least the, the very, very important ones, are covered by different ROPs in the program. But really, this is customizable to your environment. We've heard over the years that it's very adult acute care focused as an ROP, but I think it's a fantastic opportunity for pediatric health care uh, organizations who operate on a very unique and fragile patient population in a very unique service environment to delve into um, the specific realities of your services and address the related systems to mitigate risk. Um, Accreditation Canada should clarify it, it encourages organizations to address activities that are outside the scope of other ROPs. Um, I don't want to rain on anyone's parade. I know that Leslie was here afterwards to present on a safe surgery checklist. Uh, that's always been um, an activity that's been addressed by this ROP and, and very much accepted. We do have the safe surgery checklist ROP that came in in 2011, so there's a bit of overlap there now, but you should really strive to address issues that don't fall under the scope of another ROP. Looking at national compliance rates, again, across all health sectors for this ROP, we see that it's another one of our shining stars. From 2008 to 2009, uh, it went from 73% up to 92%, and that put it in uh, the top 10 of our 36 ROPs. It's, uh, I think it sits about number eight or nine, it looks like in terms of the highest compliance. So uh, getting into some more concrete examples of verification processes that you can address in your environment. Uh, firstly, dosing errors. Because of the vulnerable nature of many pediatric patients and the complexity of the medications used and preparing and administering these medications in pediatric patients, especially new neonates, uh, dosing errors are a very real risk. Uh, pediatric patients are also undergoing maturational changes in drug-sensitive areas like the renal and hepatic systems, and therefore may have very uh, variable responses to drugs. And since medications are universally weight-based, they often require dosage calculations. So to go back and really take a look at your services, some of the high-risk medication you may be administering in your service area. Uh, there are some simple tools out there uh, 
for those of you who are a little more advanced in your electronic systems, potentially computer-based systems that put into place flags or display pre-calculated dosage ranges. And taking a look at these dosage ranges in the context of the treatment regimen you're pulling together can really reduce variation by uh, reducing deviation from standardized ranges. Uh, consent in the pediatric environment would often be straightforward in the case where uh, a healthy relationship between a child and a patient is present and there's agreement between patient or, or parents and a physician as to the course of treatment. The lines get a bit blurred here uh, in more complex cases where there's conflicting issues between parents or guardians and a physician as to what's best for the child, or when the patient's relationship with the child is compromised, such as situations of child abuse or in child protection cases. So what organizations should really strive for here is having mechanisms and policies in place for their staff to deal with such scenarios, especially in the cases of urgent care. And this should really be part of uh, ongoing information and training to staff on what these policies are and in these situations how to apply them to minimize the risk to really the patient, the family, and uh, the organization delivering the services. Verbal orders is another example of a high-risk process. Verbal orders being transcribed really carry a large potential for error, yet they do remain a necessary practice in some instances. And as a result, verbal orders uh, should really have related systems put in place to minimize the chance of error. Examples that you can use to address verbal orders or these error risks are readback or repeat back procedures uh, between staff and over the telephone especially. And you can also use double signatures between a transcribing nurse and a physician and this should really put some mechanisms in place that will minimize errors through verbal orders. Another example is notification of critical test results. Uh, this is especially prevalent risk in the outpatient or ambulatory care settings. Organizations should really assess and prioritize what type of critical test results they have coming back based on their services, and then implement systems to ensure that patients and families are, in fact, receiving those results. Systems may include some automatic alerts or portion functions in your electronic medical records, the flagging of patient charts, which are kept in a distinct area, and uh, a detailed record of calls that are made to attempt to notify a patient of test results. And also, as patient populations become more tech savvy and technology advances, we maybe see practices moving towards email alerts, uh, mobile device alerts, etc. On this last slide, I just wanted to, to spit out a whole pile of examples, uh, some which apply in the pediatric settings and some which do not. But it's really just to foster some idea generation as you go back to your organizations and start thinking about what processes you may want to address. Um, some here that popped up in more of a pediatric setting were uh, doing risk assessments uh, of your environment for choking risks for children. Uh, again, medications blood transfusions, these type of activities are always very high risk and worth addressing in your organization. But really, the point here is that you're the masters of your domain. You know your services better than anyone else, what the risk areas are and where the error traps lie. And the verification process is ROP is a great lever to give you that flexibility to take those issues on head on with some leadership support and really maximize the quality and the safety of the care that you're delivering to your patients. Uh, one great resource that I came across last night that I wanted to pass along, this was a website from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it's called Safer Healthcare for Kids. Uh, you'll see some of the tabs al along the bottom of the logo here. The resources tab had a fantastic drop-down menu which you could look at evidence, policies, and different links to important patient safety initiatives, and you could sort that by the specific areas of patient safety. So I believe in, on right on the main page yesterday, it was great for, for my purposes, patient identification was the first one on the page. So there was a lot of great stuff there for any of the issues that you're trying to address in your organization. 
And lastly, just a few key messages for you to take back. Uh, one of the things that was identified with the CAFC chairs in, in pulling together the content for the session was that it wasn't so much that people were struggling with the two client identifiers, ROP, but it was that they people got it, but it was tough sustaining it in, in the routine everyday practice. And I just wanted to say that I think stories are one of the most powerful things that you can use in your organization to really give these patient safety initiative, initiatives uh, a name and a face. So sharing those stories, those near misses and good catches that happen in your hospital, on your ward, in your unit, or even in peer hospitals, uh, really go far to keep this relevant, that it's the best thing for the patient in people's eyes. I, don't, I just want to emphasize again, the ROPs are not for accreditation. You really want to strive to integrate these into your everyday workflow on a continuous basis and really adapting your processes so that you're making the right thing to do the easiest thing to do in your everyday work. So that's it for me. I'm happy to take questions or if the rapid fire presentation has come along, uh, I will hand off to her or the chairs. Thanks very much. Greg, thank you so much. Um, that was that was absolutely terrific and just very, very well articulated. Um, I think what, uh, first of all, I just want to, to reference the Pulitzer Prize opportunity. Perhaps not a Pulitzer Prize in the immediate future, but at the same time, I really do believe extremely relevant and helpful uh, for our population, for our colleagues, and uh, and I, I think, in particular, the references that you bring forward, I know, are always uh, always a huge, huge asset as well. I think what we're going to do is, um, I know that we have received a number of questions. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our call, um, Lisa is tracking those. And we will have a more formal uh, Q&A session um, after our rapid fire presentation. If uh, if that's okay, Greg. Yeah, that that sounds perfect. So we'll let you uh, we'll let you take a breath, and and I've got uh, I've got a few things I wanted to follow up as well. So at uh, and again, just let me say thank you to you on behalf of everyone, and have you sit back and enjoy the rapid fire now, and then we'll have questions for both you and uh, and Leslie Galloway. So without any further ado, um, Lisa has informed me that Leslie is online and uh, and is uh, is ready to uh, to join us. I believe that uh, Lisa is going to put up um, the surgical checklist. Lisa, is that? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, can we you. can. Great! I was so worried. <laughs> oh, Leslie is wonderful. Oh, you weren't connected. <laughs> We kept getting these messages, including just another one a couple of seconds ago, saying dial in, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. <laughs> all right. Well, Leslie, let me, first of all, welcome you. Thank you. And uh, I, it's always my pleasure to introduce Leslie, who is a longstanding member of CAFC's Patient Safety Collaborative, a true colleague and champion of all of the work that we do. And Leslie comes today from... Uh, the Child Health Quality Team. Uh, Leslie is their quality officer, and of course, that's at the Winnipeg Children's Hospital, uh, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. So, Leslie, without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to you to bring to light uh, your implementation process of, of the surgical checklist. Um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, introduce Willow Yakachuk, who's here with me um, in my office. And Willow is the clinical resource nurse in the operating room at Children's Hospital and was one of our champions on our working group um, and very much uh, involved in not only helping us implement but also helping us sustain our use of the surgical checklist. And what we're going to do this morning is that we've uh, we actually do have a little bit of a presentation uh, that we're going to run through for you and our course are, would be very pleased to answer any questions and certainly, um, you know, based on uh, also listening to Greg's presentation this morning. So our presentation this morning is really going to focus on our development of um, a surgical checklist um, and also how we've implemented it and how we're working at sustaining it. So. 
From a background perspective, uh, we became aware of the WHO Safe Surgery Saves Lives checklist, um, and we knew that it had been created by an international group of experts to improve safety for patients undergoing surgical procedures. We then, um, at our Surgical Patient Flow Working Group, reviewed um, the article uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine that was published in January of 2009 titled, a surgical safety checklist to reduce morbidity and mortality in a global population. Um, we, we also were aware uh, that this was be going, going to be an issue um, from an accreditation perspective and, and an issue that we needed to, to look at to see how we could best um, use this opportunity uh, to improve our practices within the operating room. So we established a working group in April of 2009. We had representation from our surgery program, anesthesia, and of course nursing. Um, not just from the OR, but from the day surgery area, our, our surgical ward, and uh, the emergency department, as well as our post-anesthetic care unit. Um, at this working group, we reviewed the WHO surgery safety checklist and uh, again, um, tried to determine how best we could use this um, as an opportunity to improve. We made a decision um, to develop a document that you see in front of you uh, that basically would follow the child through their surgical experience, whether it started, whether they started in our emergency department, our day surgery area, or the ward. Um, as you can see, the preoperative checklist is on page one. And what we have determined was that if a child comes in requiring emergent surgery and needs to be in the OR immediately, what are the things that we need to do um, that are key for that area? Um, and it, in terms of preparing the child quickly to go to the operating room. So that, um, you can see it on section one. If a child is going to the OR in a um, period of time greater than two hours, then both uh, columns are, are completed. And as you can see, the second page of the form, and I'm hoping you're able to see that, um, incorporates, then incorporates the components of the WRJ, w, RHA, WHO Surgical Safety Checklist. Um, I can tell you that we had multiple PDSA cycles uh, to trial the form. Um, in our day surgery surgical ward and the emergency department, we were doing a lot of fairly significant tweaking, and then we um, got to the point where the tweaks were quite minor, and subsequent to our implementation, we've had actually no further suggestions for, for tweaks at this point in time. The form um, was lastly trialed in the operating room. We wanted to really have our ducks in order before we moved it to full operation within the OR, and we used that time that we were developing the form and trialing it on the units to communicate through different forums um, to groups within the OR that would be important uh, for us to have significant buy-in uh, prior to, to moving forward with implementation in, in the OR. So I'm going to stop now. Um, Will is going to talk a little bit about uh, the implementation within the operating room itself, and then I will finish with some key success factors. We both will and um, then certainly available to answer any questions. So, okay. Willow. Thanks, I see. Welcome, Willow. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, it's really important to have that champion group, and uh, we identified that early on. Uh, we sought out people who uh, believed in it and were committed to trying it. And so we had the head of surgery, Dr. Jack McPherson, uh, one of our anesthetists, Dr. Ruth Graham, surgeon Dr. Heather Levin from ENT, and a couple of nurses, Catherine and Terry. And uh, not to say we didn't have others involved, as Leslie said before, we had support from day surgery and uh, PACU, the CRN groups and unit managers. And uh, I've been to uh, regional meetings, and uh, one of the biggest complaints is that having a hard time getting the docs on board. And uh, I truly believe it's because they hadn't started with a champion group to implement that change. Our checklist is a little different in that it includes activities that we do on a daily basis, uh, such as making sure the ventilation is on in the theater and the basic equipment is working, such as lights, cauteries, and um, the anesthetic machine. Uh, these are little things 
these little things are, are basically a communication starter also for the team and for new staff. It's an excellent way to boost their self-confidence and understand the need for standardization. Our sign-in is similar to the WHO recommendations with some operational additions uh, that I previously mentioned. And the timeout, very important. We're a small OR, so our introductions are done rather informally. But if there's a new, um, a new member, we make sure everybody um, knows who that person is. And we make a habit of writing the team members on a wall board in these theaters, which, again, enhances the team atmosphere. It's at this time where we confirm name procedure allergies and the surgical and uh, anesthetic um, anesthetist, uh, the sur surgery, sorry, surgeon and anesthetist, they review, um, they do their reviews uh, in this sign-in area. And, you know, sometimes you question, is, is that the best area? Um, maybe the timeout area is better for that. Uh, so it does overlap in some cases. Um, the sign-out, again, it resembles the WHO recommendations with counts, specimen checks, and issues with equipment. And we've made it our own with operational checks by standardizing our transfer reports so nothing is missed. Some of the challenges, well, uh, change is hard for some people to accept, even if it has uh, the airline industry and WHO backing. So we persevered and listened to all our staff, which resulted in many drafts of this form. Uh, but that was what was needed to um, get this done. So after working with this form for many months, we now realize uh, a need for some of the alterations, um, such as maybe a debriefing, a debriefing check uh, to be done sometime before the patient leaves the OR. Uh, we have conversations informally but uh, for our team check to complete the OR portion of our checklist, we need to ask the questions, how did we do and what could we have done better? So our form trial is up in November, and um, you know, I think we'll be making it even better. So in terms of you know, what was helpful for us, I think just from critical success factors, um, we had, as you can hear, a very strong uh, multidisciplinary team um, with very um, cha champions who were very, very helpful and supportive of the process, challenged us but also helped us as we move forward. We were, we've done multiple trials of the form. Um, we had frontline staff involvement. Uh, we were actually able to, what we did was we combined a couple of forms, actually, and updated forms in the pre-op uh, section on the first page so that actually it was more in keeping with what our needs are currently. Several of our forms had not been updated um, for a period of time. Um, the other issue is I think that helped us is that we were very responsive to staff concerns about the form. We listened to what they were saying to us and tried to, to make it uh, operationally effective. Um, and again, as Willow has uh, indicated, we had very important to have the uh, champions in the OR. And as well, when we did go live in the OR, we did debriefings. Um, so that we were, we talked with staff on a sort of a daily basis. Okay, what was good? What wasn't good? What do we need to do to try to, to try to make this work? And I think that, um, and I'll let Willow talk a little bit about this, but um, our good saves, and I think that um, Greg sort of referenced this, the storytelling um, has been extremely helpful to us in actually um, in, um, building um, additional buy-in for the process. Um, and I'll let Willow sort of talk about it, but just sort of lastly, persistence, our positive approach, and, and we have really persevered um, to, to try to make this go forward. So Willow, do you want to maybe just talk about sort of the good saves that, uh, that we've recognized? Well, we keep, a, we keep a record of saves at our desk in a book, and, uh, you know, it's not full of hundreds of saves, but, you know, the few that are in there mostly are, are the antibiotics pre op that would have uh, maybe otherwise been missed. And another, another major one is um, NPO status. Uh, just recently, an anesthetist forgot to ask anything about NPO. Uh, and it was caught on the checklist, and um, the case was uh, delayed. So you know, those are a couple that uh, just come to mind and very important. And just like Greg had said you know, in his presentation, it's great for everyone to hear about them. 
I think the other one event that I remember specifically from last summer was there has been an event involving the ordering of blood, and the, the blood had been outdated in terms of the ordering process. But what we were able to do was to take that event and actually talk about it and build something into the checklist. And there was actually good consultation with surgery and with anesthesia about how best we could do that. And actually, I saw that as a significant success for this project because we were actually all working together um, to, to make this work. So that's been our experience. Um, I know that other people have had have gone about this in a somewhat different way. Um, and uh, we're very interested in hearing about that. Um, but that is just our very small experience uh, with the surgical uh, checklist. So thank you. Leslie and Willow, thank you both very, very much. That was um, that was excellent, excellent. And, and, and again, as a rapid fire, I think you, you brought the very, very key messages to the front very quickly. So thank you for that. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a few questions on this as well. I think just in the interest of time and doing a time check, we have about 10, 10 or 12 minutes uh, left on our call. So Lisa, uh, can I turn to you to sort of help facilitate the, the questions and answers, please, for both uh, Leslie uh, Willow and, uh, and Greg? Uh, certainly. Uh, there's been a few questions uh, about seeing the slides again, and uh, so just want to let everybody know that the slides will be made available after this session, and we will be posting the entire presentation in uh, in a more podcast form on the Cafe Knowledge Exchange Network. So we also have a question from uh, Diane Dyer from um, Alberta Health Services. Not sure where in Alberta, but. Uh, uh, it's not, well, so she says, hope to use photos in long-term care settings and wonder about the dating of the photos. Should the photos be updated annually? Hmm. Uh, verification is difficult with dementia patients, and does anybody have any more ideas? Very, very good question. Okay, I could probably, this is Greg, I could yeah. probably take a, a first stab at that one. Go uh, ahead. I think, I think photos in that environment are definitely acceptable and I do agree depending on sort of the kid condition or status of the patient that they should be regularly updated those photos and again that that will probably change with the patient status but uh, especially with dementia patients and and if there's not you know family or guardian or fa family around all the time to uh, you know verify their idea a photo would be acceptable but I would definitely like to hear from the group if anyone else has suggestions that they use in that patient population. Mm -hmm. So again, in that outpatient or ambulatory setting, um, if, if there was anyone or, or several people who wanted to share their experiences, that would be really helpful. So actually, that, that was it for the questions that people have typed in. Um, uh, if you have some responses for Diane or some ideas um, about uh, things to use in these unique settings, uh, if you could uh, just type them into your control panel, that would be great and I could uh, share them. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to try to unmute Diane and see if she can uh, that would be great. Has any other comments? I know you're using a, a microphone and your computer microphone and speakers. Diane, are you able to talk to us? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Oh, Terrific. Excellent. Yeah, so we're just at the point of developing a policy on this, and our big pushback is from the long-term care group. Um, they just don't know how they can do this with dementia patients, so I was wondering if anybody has any ideas. And of course, one of the areas that sometimes gets forgotten is that the long-term care area, truly there's multiple, multiple medications, um, and it's, it's really serious, so we need to be verifying. Yeah. And perhaps an area that we haven't been as diligent. Go ahead. Lisa, did somebody have a, a response? No, there are no responses at this point, so um, I'm going to do an experiment and try to unmute all the lines and see if uh, people are, feel more free to, to speak that way. Unmuted.
Um, it's Diane here again. I'm wondering if I can possibly connect with Greg after this, and maybe we can chat a little bit about some things. Diane, but sorry, I, that would be great, Diane. Um, I can get you my if you maybe email the Patient Safety Collaborative. I can they could give you my email address. For sure, I'll be terrific. Sure. Okay. Yeah, for you. Perfect. That's just great. Okay. And if anybody has any other questions um, um, at the end of this, please uh, set, you can send them to me, and I can forward them to um, uh, to Greg or to Leslie, or even send them out to, to the broader Cassie, um Patient Safety Collaborative, and see if people have different ideas or different solutions for things. And we and we can then follow up and post them as well. I think maybe Lisa, we should probably mute. Is it difficult to mute again? Just Okay, that, that's great. Um, I think, too, I, a question that I wanted to put out there, um, and maybe, again, direct this to Leslie and Willow, and, uh, Willow and, then, and then maybe Greg as well, the stories that you talk about, I certainly believe this is a tremendous uh, utility and, 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 a, and a very uh, useful way to go. Um, can Le Leslie, can you give us a sense of you know you you, you talked about um, these um, you know the, the the sort of the catches or um, keeping record of the saves? How how do you share that information with as many people as possible? Um, it's Leslie. I'm um, I, I don't. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's okay. okay. I'm a great believer in storytelling um, and storytelling based on experience. And we definitely share these issues and in all types of forums. Our OR committee, our surgical patient flow project working group, our surgical patient care team, anywhere where there's the opportunity for us to discuss, you know, just wanting you to know that this helped us today by you know, and, and letting everybody know. Because I think that that adds value to what you're trying to accomplish. And Absolutely. I think it also gives uh, staff a sense that, oh, you know what, this is useful, this is working for us. Um, and I, I really, really, really believe it's important. I don't know, Willow, what no, your I thoughts are as well. I, I suspect that some of this um, good save um, work is also being shared, I would imagine, at the OR during report processes and also internally. Um, so I think that, that it, it is important to do that and to, to provide the feedback to staff who may or may not be directly affected. You know, this is indeed helping us. Good, good. Okay, because again, I, it, it's such an important uh, feedback, uh, feedback loop, absolutely. Just coming back to the ROP that um, one of the two ROPs that, that Greg was, was talking about under the um, checking systems with, with um, higher risk activities, the choking risk kind of jumped out at me. And of course, pediatrics or infants, children, and youth are not the only population that that, that would be a high risk, but it, we certainly are one of, you know, the two obviously that come to mind are, are our pediatric population and then of course seniors. But um, I wonder if anybody online has any experience specifically around policies or, or guidelines or practices that you've implemented in your respective organizations around um, helping to mitigate that, that particular risk. Um, Elaine, it's Leslie. Yeah. Um, and I can just speak from our experience here, um, and actually this has been in place for a number of years, but we, we specifically um, have uh, practices uh, related to the risk of IV tubing entanglement uh, and how we assess that risk. Um, and one of the, um, the reasons for our use of individuals who, are, who sit with children um, when family members are not available, um, this is a, an area that um, comes under our constant care um, reasons uh, because of, of this. This is a significant issue for us. 
Absolutely, and I'm sure it is for the majority of our of our you know of our colleagues across the country. That's great, Leslie. Thank you. Okay, um, Lisa, let me just double check with you before I do a couple of wrap up comments. Any other questions no, sitting no on the questions. chat line? Okay, so just a just a very quick. Uh, wrap up. Uh, first of all, Leslie, Willow, and, and Greg, thank you. Um, absolutely fantastic information that has been shared and I know um, so relevant to, uh, to all of us online and, and, and our respective colleagues and communities. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, just let everybody know that um, one of the tremendous value adds of our partnership with Accreditation Canada is an opportunity for a two-directional, if you will, dialogue. So we certainly benefit tremendously by sharing of information the way we have this morning, the way we're going to continue. And that, of course, is, is Accreditation Canada bringing um, really this important information and sharing it with us. It's also an opportunity, bringing that two-directional, it's an opportunity for us, and I know this is very welcome, but for our community, I'll refer to it as the CAFC broader community, to provide feedback to Accreditation Canada. And we've, we've talked a little bit about doing that on today's call, and I would really encourage all of us where when you think you know, it's appropriate and something that you would really like to send back um, to really feel comfortable in doing that. Um, I know it's very welcomed and it really is one of the goals and objectives of our of our partnership. So I just wanted to uh, to emphasize that. Um, when, um, when Greg was talking about the first ROP around um, mitigating wrong patient errors around patient identification as well as related uh, treatment and interventions. We talked, um, there was a bullet on one of your slides, Greg, about barcoding. I just wanted to let everybody online know that still to be confirmed but likely our June uh, webinar um, will in fact bring, um, shed a tremendous amount of light on where we are as a healthcare system across the country um, within the area of barcoding. So I just wanted to sort of flag that as a, as a um, um, uh, sort of coming, coming event um, likely in, uh, in, in June of, um, of, of this year. Um, if there are no other questions, um, or let me just say um, Greg or, or um, Leslie Willow, did you want to add anything just before we wrap up? It's Leslie, no. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Greg? Thanks, thanks again, Elaine. That's, that's great for me. Okay. I want to thank Lisa, as always, for making this happen. She is the orchestrator behind all of this. And I also want to thank all of our participants for joining us this morning. Our next patient safety collaborative uh, call will be on April the 29th, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Happy spring, everybody, and uh, certainly looking forward to welcoming everybody back on April the 29th. Spread the word and invite your colleagues to join us. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.